Michael Corrin has been on some kind of a spiritual journey. For 15 years, he hosted his eponymously named TV show on Crossroads Television, in which he didn't hesitate to share his very conservative views while aggressively mixing it up with a variety of guests. Today, he turns the other cheek. He is an ordained minister in the Anglican Church of Canada, has pretty significantly changed some of his previous views, and has now written a book called The Rebel Christ. The actor Stephen Fry describes him as a writer of integrity, wit, and passion, a fine advocate for the best of Christian thought. And with that, we welcome Michael Corrin back to TVO from High Park in Ontario's capital city. Reverend, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? Doing pretty well. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I used to call you Michael, but now I guess I guess I have to show some respect and call you the Rev now, don't I? No, you don't show me any respect at all. You call me whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we start with this? The very first thing you write in this book is a, a, a very good question, so we're going to start there. You write, why is it that the purest, most supremely liberating philosophy and theology in all of history is now seen by so many people around the world as an intolerant, legalistic, and even irrelevant religion embraced only by the gullible, the foolish, and the judgmental. You want to start to just suggest an answer to that question here? <laughs> well, I think it's probably because of, uh, well, people like me not that long ago. I mean, my change of heart and change of life really was only about eight years ago. Um, and I was... I wasn't a bad person. I tried to do good. I, I tried to help. I tried to be on the right side, but I don't think I was. And I think I, I painted a picture of Christianity because I knew it and I knew Jesus, if the language doesn't sound too pious. But the Christianity I knew was legalistic. It was more conservative. It was preserving a status quo. And it wasn't relevant, really, to to people today. You, know, you don't have to be relevant. I mean, if you think you're right, you're, you're right. But what we have today is a Christianity that when it is mentioned at all, and let's be honest, a lot of people watching now are probably saying, I'm not interested in this. I'm not interested in religion. Because what they see uh, on television, in media, and I'm a journalist, I don't, uh, I, I understand why this is the case, is when Christianity is calling for something to be banned or something to be stopped or complaining about vaccinations or mask wearing or campaigning against abortion or or equal marriage, and it's, it's a negative, it's restrictive, when in fact it is extraordinarily liberating, and it liberated me, it changed me from within in, in so many ways. And it, it's not that media is on a conspiracy course here. The loudest noise is often made in the shallowest end of the swimming pool, I'm afraid, hmm. um, and certain parts of the church, and it is a minority. They do know how to make a splash. And so the vast majority of Christians throughout the world that are indulging in organized goodness and organized kindness and trying to make the world a better place are generally ignored because they're not newsworthy. And that, that, that's okay, that's not a critique of media. But when you know the Christian world, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a priest now, most of my work is with people in, in churches. When you see the sacrifice and how, how much good is being done, that's a world away from the, 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 the conservative churches, the evangelical right and the right wing fringe of the Catholic Church, but that, that is, I think, if you ask most people, what does Christianity mean? They will say, well, isn't it people who don't want to be vaccinated? Isn't it people campaigning outside an abortion clinic? That, that is the, the popular image. So irrelevant, maybe that's on a good day, on a bad day, actually dangerous, problematic, intolerant. I want to put another quote to you now, this one from your book, it, but it is of British writer and lay theologian C.S. Lewis, who wrote, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. What do you love so much about that quote that you put it in the book? I love him. I love C.S. Lewis, uh, one of the greatest influences on my life, and I was lucky, privileged, to know his secretary, Walter Hooper, who died just a few months ago, actually. He was a, he was a, a dear friend. What Lewis is saying there is, if you're... If, if there is an answer to life's questions, is there, if there is something that will give you happiness and joy and fulfillment, um, it can't just be ah, moderately important. If it's true, my golly, that's wonderful. And if it's untrue, it doesn't matter at all. Now, I don't go around trying to evangelize people directly. I hope I do it implicitly and indirectly through my writing and, and my work. Um, I believe, as a Christian, that 
the intervention of Jesus, of God, into human life 2,000 years ago changed everything, changed everything for the better. And so it is of enormous importance. But I know to many people, including members of my family, um, it just doesn't matter very much. They can, they believe, and I think they probably can, they can find fulfillment and completion elsewhere. I would never argue that you have to be a Christian. My parents, God rest their souls, they weren't Christians. Um, a lot of my dearest friends, Stephen Fry, who, <laughs> lovely Stephen, gave me that wonderful blurb. He's an atheist. So I think God's love and God's goodness and kindness is in everybody. Now, whether we call it Christianity and whether we live and practice as Christians is another issue. Uh, but you can be good without Christ. You can be a wonderful, giving and selfless person without belief in God. That, that's a very different argument indeed. Let's talk about this man who you say changed everything for the better uh, more than 2,000 years ago. You call him the rebel Christ. How come? There was a song a few years ago, What If God Was One Of Us, and it was written by and sung by someone who certainly weren't Christians. I don't think they believed in God. But it was a wonderful question because actually it was answered. It was answered 2,000 years ago. And God chose in this wonderful act, this leap of solidarity of love to take human form in Jesus and to suffer the fate of humanity uh, to eventually be arrested, abused, tortured, humiliated, spat at, and then murdered on a cross in, in utter degradation, to be rejected and denied by those closest to him. And what I think is extremely significant here is when God comes into the human story, it's not as a warlord or a monarch or a prince or an investment banker or, or even a, a wonderful TV host. It is as the son of a carpenter or a skilled craftsman living under occupation in a, a fairly anonymous part of the world who, who decides to spend his life living in a, a communalistic way, you could even say a socialistic way, with the poor and the marginalized and the rejected, and who has his harshest words for those who have power and wealth, who are legalistic and rigid. Now, that is not irrelevant. If people say God doesn't make mistakes, well, this wasn't a mistake. There was a deliberate choice there to come into humanity as one of the, the marginalized, not one of the powerful. That's the rebel Christ. And you just use the S word. You say, I, I guess you're saying if he were alive today and he were somewhere on the political continuum, he'd be a socialist. You think so? Well, I would never... No, I'm not going to say that explicitly. The word is anachronistic, obviously. But, uh, socialism, as we know it, wasn't around 2,000 years ago. But I would ask people to, to ask questions. Look, faith, faith is a dialogue. We, we, we argue with the Gospels, argue with the Bible. There's a dialectic. It's not divine dictation. So let's take it on and, and argue with it. But ask it questions. Jesus was who? Was he someone born into a life of power and prestige, or was he the opposite? Did he choose to spend his time with people who would have made life much easier for him and easier to spread the message in a way, those who had power and prestige and influence? He chose to live in a very specific way. He didn't own property. Uh, he lived certainly in a communal sense with a group of people. Uh, those people were not from the power elites. They were former sex workers, uh, terror leaders, tax collectors who were despised. Um, not always the poorest of the poor. Peter, a fisherman, may have owned some fishing boats. He may not have been poor. But these were certainly not people who were at the, at the center of power. He could have gone straight into the middle of the Sanhedrin, into, into the middle of Roman power. He chose something very different. It, what do you conclude from that? I wouldn't conclude that he was someone who believed in, in the status quo. And I would say that if you're too invested in society, if you're too glued and dedicated to the power and the wealth of society, the Gospels will be, will be violence to you. They will be shocking to you. They will be revolutionary to you. And I think they are. Let's pluck another quote out of the book. Here's Michael Corrin writing in The Rebel Christ. When we read the Gospels, when we study the life, character, and teachings of Jesus, can we envisage someone who would have tolerated slavery and who would remain silent in the face of racism and human degradation? Everything we know about him would make that impossible. Christians need to be completely honest about the past and also completely honest about the man they worship. Jesus isn't the establishment. Jesus is the outsider. Jesus isn't the powerful. Jesus is the powerless. Jesus isn't the slaver. Jesus is the slave. 
So writes Michael in The Rebel Christ. Now, you also go on to say that Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, who now runs his ministry, speaks for more than two million Christians, mostly in the United States. And of course, he thinks your interpretation of Jesus is completely wrong. So what's he, what's he missing that you think you get? <laughs> I certainly hope he thinks I'm completely wrong. Uh, his father was a very different man. I didn't agree with all of his father's theology, but his father, apart from a brief flirtation with President Nixon, uh, tried to be above party politics. And I, I think that was very noble of him. I don't understand Franklin Graham, and he's not unique. There are others like him. Um, his, his support for, for Putin in Russia, his, his anti-gay, homophobic comments, all sorts of things that, that do baffle me. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm not here to judge, but equally, I am allowed to give an opinion. Um, I don't know. I don't know how someone who has a genuine relationship with Yeshua, with Jesus, with this man in first century occupied Judea, Palestine, I don't know how they can have a relationship with him and say things that are as shocking as those said by Franklin Graham. And I say this as someone who, as we mentioned earlier, until about eight years ago, I was never Franklin Graham, for goodness sake, but I did say things that now it make me cringe. Um, I did think I knew Jesus back then, but I think the Jesus I knew was almost through a, um, a window that was, was dark and grimy, and it was dark and grimy with my own feelings and my own prejudices and, and my own fears and anxieties. And I think when that window is clear, when you actually see through and you can see that person, the world should be a very different place. If, if we're too soaked in, in, in fear and self-preservation and the way it's always been and what we think uh, was a noble age of the past, for the past generally wasn't that noble, then it makes it very difficult for us. Look, Christianity is, is, is frightening. It is a permanent revolution of love. You have to question yourself all the time. It, it's a bit like raising children and you think, oh, I've really got it right here. And then you realize, I really haven't. And then, then they reach a certain age and, and they question you. And, and all of those things are part of a relationship. And Christianity is less a religion than a relationship. And in relationship, you grow and you change and you question yourself. And I do wonder sometimes, with the greatest of respect, if some more conservative Christian leaders actually do this. Do they question their, their actions and their motives? Do they ask why they have certain opinions? You do tackle some of the toughest issues in our society going, and abortion is one of them. And here's what you have to say about that in the book. Abortion, you write, isn't murder. Murder is murder. Abortion isn't a holocaust. The holocaust was the holocaust. And a woman's right to choose is a woman's right to choose. That's the rebel Christ approach. Let's go to the text. What does the Bible actually have to say about abortion? As with many of these apparent uh, hot topic issues in Christianity, not a lot. Uh, Jesus doesn't mention it at all. Now, you can imply something without specific mention, but there's no reference to it, and it was certainly known in the ancient world. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, there are very few references, and, and one reference is that abortion is, is demanded in the case of, uh, of adultery. Uh, the, the ancient Jewish idea and the Christian idea, and I think I'm right in saying within the Islamic faith as well, is that life begins at, at first breath, not at conception. So the Bible is very vague, and as I say, quite uh, startling, at least so at one point, even seems to, to say abortion is necessary. It's not a major issue. It's simply not a major issue, but it has become the dominant theme in much of contemporary Christianity within the Catholic Church, which has wonderful teaching on, on many social justice issues. And lately, lately on the evangelical right, and this is worth mentioning because the evangelical church, even the conservative parts of it, and most of it is fairly conservative, was relatively progressive and permissive on the abortion issue until fairly late, until the, the mid-1960s. That was when it changed its view. Now, the Catholic Church has been fairly static on this, uh, but of course it was after Roe v. Wade and liberalization in the 70s that it became quite, quite militant about the issue. And I'm not arguing that abortion is, 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 a, is a good thing. I think women's rights are, are vital, but many of us would like abortion rates to drop. And I think I, I may say in the book that we can achieve this if we make sure that there is good modern sex ed in every school, contraceptives are freely available. If we have socially um, 
paid for uh, daycare and childcare, socialized medicine, if we enforce fraternity payments, if we liberate women. All of these things are opposed by the, the very Christian right that want to make abortion illegal. And I don't think they're actually living biblical principles. I think what they're talking about is control, control of women. It's, it's not about life, it's about control. And there used to be within the anti-abortion movement uh, the idea of the seamless garment, that life was always precious, conception to natural death, and they were anti-war and anti-death penalty. That's gone. The anti-abortion movement now, well, if you want a figurehead, Donald Trump, for goodness sake, and the Christian right, that is not about life. So, yes, women's rights certainly are, are, are I think, profoundly Christian. At any time a, a group that has faced oppression in society is given liberation and more rights, as Christians, we should rejoice in that. Let me pick up on the issue of sex ed, which you just raised there. And I do have to say, you are really good on Twitter. Um, I have seen, I mean, you get attacked a lot on Twitter, and, and in virtually every instance where I've seen you be attacked on Twitter, you don't take the bait. You give a very, if I may put it this way, Christian response. Um, <laughs> you did respond on the issue of sex ed, though, very cleverly, I must say. I think this was one of your best tweets. You wrote, I sympathize with those who fear that sex ed will sexualize kids. Our youngest studied World War I on a Monday. By Friday, he'd invaded Belgium. <laughs> That's pretty, cu uh, pretty cute there, Michael. But um, what exactly was the point you were trying to make there? Well, the, the notion that because a, a young person, a child, studies sex education in school, they will suddenly become, uh, I don't know, sexually active or a, a sexual lunatic. Or, I mean, it, it, anyone who thinks that and says that surely has not raised children. I mean, generally, the kids know probably more than the teachers do, and the teachers can be fairly embarrassed about the whole thing. But I remember when in Ontario we introduced, or there was an attempt to introduce, a more modern sex education. And I, um, even in my early days, I was supporting that. I actually lost a job because of it. It was just common sense. It's a very caring way to introduce children into a reality of life. And just because you learn about sex doesn't mean, of course, you become a practitioner. And the people were speaking out of fear. Opponents of sex ed were speaking out of fear. They were reacting hysterically. If I allow this to happen, what happens next? What happens next? Math class, English class, I don't know. I mean, it, it's really, it's not, but it's important. I mean, it's, I don't talk about this in the book, I don't think, but it's important for young people because it protects them. For goodness sake, abusers rely on ignorance. They want children to know as little as possible. That children need the, the self-defense of education in, in every area of life. And Christianity should not be detached from the fleshy reality of our existence. Look, I, I, I tell you, as a priest, a lot of what I deal with is people at the end of their lives, death and suffering. And once you do that, it, it does wake you up to what, what this is really about. So we are about the reality of, of the human condition, the narrative of, of someone leading their life. And it's not always pretty. And when it comes to sexuality, let's not obsess about this thing. It's natural, wonderful, it's part of life, it's God-given. All sex education is doing is making sure that kids understand it properly. Let me raise with you now uh, one of the most important issues that our country is trying to grapple with uh, right now, and that is the issue of residential schools and the impact, the terrible impact, frankly, they have had uh, over many generations. Uh, you know, of course, that the majority of the residential schools in this country were set up by the church, and there was a lot done, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus Christ. How do you reconcile the Jesus you love and know with the Jesus whose name was invoked not that long ago uh, to, do some of, to do some of the worst in Canadian history? You can't. And you can't if we look at the Crusades or um, pogroms. Or so, I mean, so much, so much harm has been done in the name of, well, in the name of most things, but certainly in the name of Christianity. And it's no good trying to form an argument of what they thought at the time and, and not everybody was bad. None of that is relevant. What matters is that using the Prince of Peace, using a man who was willing to give his life for humanity, who said, do not judge, embrace, include, love, extend the circle, 
Um, that name was used to enslave and colonize and oppress. And it's an open wound. And my church, the Anglican Church, I think has been quite good on, on this issue fairly early, other denominations less so. But let's not for one moment try and pretend. Uh, what was done was vehemently, vehemently anti-Christian, because it was anti-love and anti-empathy and anti-understanding. And, um, you know, I, I came to this country 34 years ago. I, well, I didn't grow up with the, the, the knowledge of indigenous issues and so on. And uh, I'll never forget a story that a, 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 someone told me, an indigenous uh, activist, really. And, and he told this story in a church, and, and he said that his grandfather would never hug him. And this hurt him because he loved his grandfather very much. And he, he once said, you know, Grandpa, what, why do you never hug me? And his grandpa said to him, when I was at residential school, a hug meant I will be raped. And I sat there at, with my head in my hands, trying not to cry, trying to be as English as possible. Um, when you hear that stuff, it, 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 shame, just absolute shame. No defense, no words, just take action to make sure as much, admit what we've done, contrition, absolute ownership of crime, try in every way possible to repair damage. It may not be compensation if that's part of it. But no arguments about this, just we did it, and it must, it, it must be admitted. Michael, in our remaining moments here, I just want to finish off by asking you a couple of personal questions. Uh, now that you are wearing that collar, you are, as you've pointed out, a, a, a different person from the person whom I first met, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. So let's, let me ask this, how much do you pray now? Uh, most of the time, sometimes formally, I, I morning prayer and the office of the day as a priest, I say that and other forms of prayer, uh, but a lot of the time uh, in the car, um, life doesn't work without it. And I, again, I know people might think, oh, really? Um, whatever prayer, whatever form the prayer might take, it can just be eyes closed and thinking, meditation, contemplation. Uh, but. Um, I can't do it without prayer because I know how pathetic I am. Um, and uh, even with prayer, I'm pretty awful. But without prayer, it just wouldn't be possible. And having said that, what do you pray for? Well, I pray as part of a, of a conversation. And, and prayer changes me more than it changes God. And I do ask for things, um, but they're not selfish things, I hope. Um, they're, I hope they're grander than that. I pray for understanding. And I pray that I can be better at what I am, uh, that I can be more forgiving and um, kinder and more open. And, you know, don't know if it works or not, but I, I pray. I, I pray just to listen as well and to, to center myself. And I often pray for other people, which is not the I'm going to pray for you line, because that can be very insulting and very reductive. But there are people who want to be prayed for, and it's important to do that. Well, one of the reasons we've had you on this program so many times over the years is that you keep writing absolutely fascinating, provocative, thought-provoking books. So um, my hunch is as long as you keep doing that, we're going to keep having you back. Michael <laughs> Corrin's latest is called The Rebel Christ, and we're grateful it's brought, us to, uh, brought him rather to our virtual studio here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much, Reverend, and you be well. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.